Over the last few years, Aspermont has transformed from an 187-year-old print publisher to become a leading media tech innovator. The company has successfully navigated adverse market conditions, completed a full business turnaround and a full-scale commercial model transformation, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. Emerging from it all, our business is stronger, fitter, and more relevant than ever before. Aspermont shareholders have seen strong returns over the last few years, but we believe those will pale in comparison to the company's true and future valuation. Aspermont is already in a high growth phase, and today's presentation will focus on some of the new upcoming technological enablers that will drive that growth to the next level. When considering Aspermont's investment appeal against comparable companies and other market conditions such as high inflation and interest rate rises, investors should keep in mind these important differentiating facts. Aspermont is high growth, high margin, profitable and cash generative. The company has high unit economics, a strong balance sheet, no debt, and is facing a blue ocean opportunity in sectors that employ 22% of the world's population and account for roughly one fifth of global GDP. This presentation has been released to the market simultaneously to our session today, as it contains unseen market sensitive information. Aspermont is the leading media services provider to the global resource industries. We are the dominant player globally in mining and have regionally dominant positions in energy and agriculture. We now have more than 30 brands serving a global audience of decision makers in the resource sectors. And over the last few years, we have amassed a network of more than 8 million board, executive and senior management contacts. Our digital content and services are now used by more than 3.7 million people across 190 countries. Aspermont's history over the last 187 years has evolved through three distinct phases. Our legacy over 180 years was as a print publisher. The recent period when new management arrived and affected a business turnaround. And now as we manage significant evolution in our core business models. Aspermont has a brand portfolio with over 560 years of combined heritage with Mining Journal is our 187 year old icon. But the company has also been at the forefront of media technology since the turn of the millennium. In the early 2000s, Aspermont pioneered digital paywalls with a paid subscription strategy well ahead of the largest media organizations in the world. Aspermont, for example, released a fully paywalled MiningNews.net digital brand in 2001, at a time when everyone else heralded, heralded the internet as a medium for free content with low cost volume based advertising models. It was not until some years later in 2008 that the largest news organizations, News Corp and Financial Times, for example, began to adopt payroll models like Aspermont. Aspermont's digital growth in the early 2000s was impressive. By 2015, Aspermont had massed over a million users on the net, establishing a bedrock of digital subscribers. But the company's primary income drivers were still print advertising and live events at that time. Over the period between 2014 to 2017, structural decline in print advertising and the disposal of our events business caused significant disruption for Aspon, who saw 85% of its revenues wiped out in that period. In the face of such severe impacts, many companies would not survive. But fortunately for Aspont, by 2017, we had been able to reorganize our business to affect a full-scale turnaround. And this turnaround phase established the foundations for operational agility as evidenced in the expanding gross profit margins in the business today. From 2018 onwards, after our stabilization phase, we have sequentially pivoted each of our core revenue streams. Not only has Aspont been repositioned as a content data and services company, but the characteristics of our income streams have changed as well. Today, our focus is on revenue quality rather than quantity, 
which means high margin, recurring, and market resilient revenue streams. This year, as Aspermont emerges from the commercial impacts of the pandemic, it enters a fourth phase of growth, and one which will be underpinned by technological development and talent acquisition. Specifically, Aspermont is building an audience client ecosystem for the resource industries and to commercialize them through three integrated ZAS models. We are one of the very few organizations able to monetize both audiences and our client base simultaneously and from the same services. By delivery of engaging content, our content as a service model, by analysis and packaging of behavioral and usage data, our data as a service model, and through our ability to bring buyers and sellers together via our marketing as a service model, we effectively assume the pivotal role at the center of our ecosystems. Since the beginning of our new evolution phase, our CAS model has been the primary focus. And so far we have generated 23 consecutive quarters of high performance growth in it. The fundamental elements of this CAS model are the same as with an organization like Netflix. We have a platform, we produce content, and we charge customers to consume that content via a recurring subscription fee. The differences between us and a Netflix type model are clearly the size of our addressable markets and the fact that we are a business to business provider with the ability to affect pricing through super niche premium services. Our services business, as it amalgamates our legacy products with our new marketing agency style products, increasingly delivers high quality recurring revenues. Our new content works business, which we'll cover uh, in more detail later, is evolving us towards a mass model. In our data business, we aggregate, analyze, repackage, and publish market data to our subscribers as new high value services. We also repackage audience trends and insights for our clients, essentially via a Facebook type model which over the next few years will become a highly significant income driver for the business. Our three ZAS models generate high revenue quality, work symbiotically with each other and generate a network effect. We focus on certain verticals to build our brand strength, which gives us the credibility to occupy the middle ground in this ecosystem. No media organization would normally have the right to be the orchestrator of such a large and strategic global ecosystem. But our brand heritage, content and market leading position give us this great opportunity. In 2016, Aspont announced the completion of a long-term development project with the release of our Horizon platform. This multi-channel publishing platform triggered a butterfly effect to Aspont, enabling us not only to unify our legacy systems, but also to remove most of our physical IT infrastructure. And importantly, it enabled us to collect, structure, and better analyze key audience and internal productivity data sets. The intelligence derived from this new data brought new IP and processes, most prominently in our customer lifecycle journeys for subscriptions, and in turn helped us optimize income streams and transform our infrastructure and workforce efficiencies. The remote working capabilities enabled by Horizon changed Aspont's entire human capital model, FTE to staff ratios, enabling management to create more agile, time zone flexible operational structures to better serve a global customer base. In addition to significant productivity gains and operational cost savings, Horizon facilitated the delivery of a CAS model, which as we've said, has now delivered 23 consecutive quarters of growth. Horizon was the first and most important technological change of Aspermont's post-turnaround era. Following the success of Horizon, our next large-scale platform development is Skywave. While Skywave will take several years to build, there will be serial data product releases along the way. In essence, Skywave will draw together all our internal systems data all our audience client ecosystem data and all our acquired data sets, present and future, into one platform. By centralizing, analyzing, combining, slicing and dicing these information segments, 
we will be able to build an ongoing sea of new data intelligence products for both our audience and our clients, whilst at the same time optimizing internal processes and our own automated marketing systems. We have already started to commercialize Skyway via a successful three-year pilot in B2B lead generation and are now moving towards full-scale implementation while building the new internal data team. In subscriptions so far, our average revenues per unit have seen a compound growth rate over five years of 15% per annum. The high value data products that Skyway will generate could take us on an exciting journey from $1,000 of ARPU to $50,000 of ARPU as customer depth and product premiums increase. On the client services side, we recently beta launched a new boutique agency called Content Works. Given our depth of talent in journalism, with topic expertise, design and production skills alongside our market penetration and global distribution capabilities, we have been able to build a new platform to offer clients a truly end-to-end -end marketing service. Many large organizations have spent the last few years outsourcing a variety of back and middle office functions, and this has included marketing and communications. Our position in the market and our strengths make us well-placed to become the dominant Marcoms agency in our key sectors. Moving from a legacy of transactional sales to a marketing as a service solution based model helps us develop deeper and more resilient client relationships, which provide higher certainty for recurring income growth. Hopefully, the narrative so far has confirmed Aspermont's technological characteristics and capabilities. For centuries, we were a print publisher, but more and more over the last seven years, we have become a media tech innovator. In addition to Horizon, Skywave, and ContentWorks, we are developing three additional ancillary platforms, all of which we release over the next 18 months. The first, Esperanto, is a machine learning initiative to automate multilingual content translation for all our products and services. Many years ago, we developed semantic search architecture. And as a byproduct, we also developed natural language ontologies for our key sectors. Those ontologies enable us not only to translate from one language to another, but also to translate industry specific jargons. Esperanto should be in a pilot phase later this year. And given that 75% of the world for 75% of the world, English is not a spoken language. We expect Esperanto to have a powerful and positive impact on our subscriptions. Mining Journal and Mining Magazine have been in continuous production for centuries and are among the oldest publications in the English speaking world. They both represent not so much a definitive history of mining, but more the only history of mining. By digitalizing these centuries of print archives, we can uniquely create deep subscription value opportunities. In colonial times, mineral discoveries were made in many parts of the world, but not all the opportunities were developed for various reasons. However, the records of all that historical activity have significant value, both for future exploration and for potential resource development. Of course, over the last two centuries, not only has industry terminology changed, but the English language itself has changed. Broadcasting was more relevant to agriculture 100 years ago than media, for example. And so here again, we can leverage our pre-built semantic search architectures to ensure that relevant connections between the newly digitalized concept are drawn. Finally, as we announced 10 months ago, Aspermont is launching a new fintech platform called Blue Horseshoe that seeks to disrupt and democratize the global finance market for private placements. We are piloting Blue Horseshoe in Australia before rolling out to other geographies. The business has been founded with two excellent partners, IPC and Spark Plus, and a new management team has been assembled with the platform ready for imminent launch. Aspermont is a media company. It is a technology company, and more and more, it is also becoming a data company. These facts are not yet widely recognized by investors.
Over the last few years, Aspermont has demonstrated strong growth in revenues, earnings, cash flow, and margins. Despite historic constraints on capital, disruptive business models, wholesale business transformation, and most recently, the COVID pandemic. The social distancing restrictions with COVID-19 required us to suspend our live events business entirely for FY20 and FY21, with a three to $5 million of likely revenue lost in both those years. Our live events business resumed in February this year, and we expect to report exceptional growth in revenues and profits for this financial year. After restructuring our balance sheet in FY16, we have become stronger each successive year. Today, our business is financially robust and with no debt. Our cash reserves are adequate to deal with the Black Swan event, and we are generating enough internal cash flow to finance our own organic growth initiatives. Progress in the first half of this financial year has been better than prior guidance. The return of live events in Q2 has resulted in exceptional growth in our services division, and we expect our normal growth to be repeated in the second half of this year. Gross and net margins continue to upscale, while free cash flow generation drives our net liquidity. In the first half of this year, Aspermont confirmed its full recovery from the impacts of the pandemic and is investing to drive forward growth momentum. Now that the business is solidly established, let's step back for a moment to assess Aspermont's macro growth opportunities in the sectors that it serves. We are clearly leaders in the field of media services for the resources sectors, but in truth, have not yet seen the great depth of our opportunity. We are serving industries with around $20 trillion in annual turnover, which is truly a blue ocean opportunity. And this makes it critical for us to prioritize and utilize our development resources effectively. Given the size of the opportunity, there could be decades of organic growth for Aspont in these three B2B sectors alone. Aspermont shareholders have seen superior market returns over the last few years, but the directors believe there is a disconnect between the appropriate valuation and the current market capitalization. We are not alone. Analysts at GBAG, the German investment bank, have analyzed Aspon for over 12 months and have raised their share price targets from 9 cent to 11 cent with growing confidence. And yet on the ASX, our share price languages, languishes at only 2 cent. Since listing in Europe a year ago, most of Aspermont's 30% free float has migrated there and so to its trading liquidity, particularly with respect to the trade gate in Lang and Schwartz exchanges. Over the next few months, the directors will consider the most appropriate mid-term market listing for Aspermont. The ASX has few technology companies with a primary listing and even fewer media tech ones. And that makes effective peer group comparisons for investors challenging. Aspermont has established operations in Europe and North America and with a growing presence in Asia. We have audiences globally, so there is optionality for our listings. Longer term, we believe the NASDAQ will likely be the best exchange for Aspermont. Over the next few years, as we achieve and surpass our growth objectives, we are building the right characteristics for a potential North American assault. I must make it clear that what you are reading is not management guidance, but an idea of what we would like to achieve over the next few years. In our present form, $30 million of turnover, with $5 million of free cash flow and consecutive growth courses in our new DAS and MAS models, like we did in our CAS business, is achievable. We also believe we can develop a dominant position in all three of our sectors as we focus on expanding our market penetration globally. And with the launch of new platforms such as Skywave, Blue Horseshoe and others, the potential is greater still. Operational capacity and not capital is now our primary growth constraint and accelerator. We need a minimum of two more executives in our management team, and our FTE to staff ratio requires further scaling. But it is fair to say that nearly all the key elements for sustained and accelerated growth are now in place.
Aspen wants is set to extend its position over the next few years. The company has 560 years of brand heritage, an agile operational structure, and an experienced leadership team with proven success. Increasingly, we have high unit economics and scalability, a financially robust, well entrenched against competitive threat, and most importantly, we remain highly ambitious. In today's world of breakout inflation and galloping debt service costs, many high growth tech companies face a harsh awakening. Aspermont is not one of their number. Aspermont is high growth with expanding margins, is cash flow generative and profitable. Aspermont has high unit economics, a strong balance sheet, and not a single dollar of debt. Aspermont shares today trade at a paltry price to sales ratio of 2.5, some six times lower than analysts forecast considered to be appropriate. Are there any better value opportunities in listed technology companies globally than Aspermont? The question is rhetorical. Investors will increasingly address the Aspermont proposition and we will get an appropriate valuation potentially on a new stock market. Thank you for listening. Quite a lot of new information there. So um, thank you very much that you use our platform to uh, publish those new information to the world. Uh, great presentation. I, I hope uh, the technical issues didn't stop anyone from listening to everything. Um, you're all welcome to post questions uh, through the chat or the Q&A function. And um, we have already some questions coming in. So, Mr. Uh, Kimasa, uh, are you ready to answer some questions from, from the audience? <laughs> oh, you're still muted. We can't hear you. Apologies for that. Uh, a morning all. Um, I, I will try my best and uh, it's a pleasure uh, uh, to be attending the, the, the conference on behalf of uh, Asmont and, and, and uh, apologies on behalf of um, Alex Kent uh, who was uh, uh, in flight and uh, could not make the timing of the, the, the conference. So, uh, uh, but very appreciative of, of the platform that uh, this has provided us. Excellent. Um, so the first question is um, the consolidation of your billions of shares planned uh, so that the share price uh, would look optically better or uh, will you stay at the at the cent or penny uh, area? Um, that's uh, something that's been debated at the board uh, numerous times. Um, as you know, um, uh, there are pros and cons of doing one or the other. Um, um, right now, um, um, the intention is to try and um, drive the value of the share through um, um, a better understanding of the company, a better understanding of the growth opportunity that um, um, we see ourselves in right now. Um, and at some point, um, I guess um, uh, there will be that discussion and, and crystallization of, of consolidation. Um, um, but only once we believe the, 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 the value that we believe the company should be at has been um, um, fully reflected um, by the marketplace. Mm -hmm. and that, that answers the question asked. Yeah, I guess. And uh, you have an ex excellent market position. You're basically the leader. Um, do you have a real competition or is there any competition out there for you? Uh, there's always competition in, in, in all of the different areas that we operate in. Um, I guess the competition is, is more regional and, and, and depending on the product and the suite that we're producing. Um, the big difference, I guess, and the unique um, uh, differentiation for us, um, at least in, in a lot of the markets that we operate in, is first of all, um, uh, there aren't any competitors who provide a global um, um, content provision, particularly across mining. Um, so that's one of the, the, the big differentiators for us. I guess the second big differentiator for us is um, we don't just generate news. Um, um, we, we, we are actually focused on quality uh, in terms of content that we produce, um, the value of that content, the research that we do. So we believe that there's, a, there's a huge value and premium on the content that we're producing uh, for consumption in the marketplace. 
And I guess the, the third key thing for us is um, um, we don't see ourselves as a, as a media business. We see ourselves as a, as a technology business. Um, but where we're unique, um, I guess, is we have established an ecosystem. Or we believe we're uh, at the center of an ecosystem within the resources sector, which is very niche, um, uh, very unique. Um, in terms of um, the information that we have, um, the presence we have, both in terms of audience, um, as well as clients that we work with. And, and so the opportunity for us, um, I guess, in terms of um, um, differentiation against competition is a lot higher um, uh, through some of the technology developments that were presented um, um, in the presentation. Okay. So uh, you said uh, most of your competition are local players. Would it make sense uh, to acquire them, or do you have any plans to to grow uh, with an M and A strategy? M um, and A is always um, something we would consider. Um, um, I guess one of the things to draw out um, from the presentation is um, uh, when we look at um, uh, uh, the addressable market uh, or the market opportunity, um, uh, both in terms of mining, um, energy, or agriculture. Um, um, there's huge organic opportunity without even um, um, looking at any significant acquisitions. Where um, acquisitions would come in play uh, and that we would consider is where it allows us um, um, to almost sort of uh, augment our capability or, or knowledge uh, or access to a market that accelerates our growth opportunity. Um, so right now we very much focus on, on all the technology developments um, uh, as well as uh, developing our data sets. Um, um, but along the line, uh, uh, acquisition opportunity will always arise. And we always come across uh, acquisition opportunities um, that come to us. Uh, uh, but yes, yeah, so acquisitions are not out of the picture. Um, um, we will always consider acquisitions if it allows us to augment what we're doing and create value. And, and it's, not a, it's not dilutive in terms of what we're doing. And in terms of uh, potential acquisitions, would that be financed internally or via the stock market or debt? Again, it depends on the size of the acquisition. Um, uh, obviously, if it's um, something sizable, but it allows us uh, a, 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 a different dynamic to kind of what we, um, 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 uh, we get from it, um, uh, we might finance it um, externally. Um, uh, if it's a, a, a smaller acquisitions, uh, which are sort of um, tucking acquisitions that allow us to sort of grow capacity or, or, or uh, 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 yes, that, that we may be able to finance internally. Mm -hmm. Then there is a, a rather broad question in the, in the Q&A function regarding the new fintech platform. Could you elaborate on that? I'm yeah, sure. The, the uh, fintech platform um, uh, is in development and, and, and we're about to uh, uh, launch the platform and go live with it. Um, um, uh, I guess one of the questions that probably will come up is, um, you know, why, why did we sort of um, uh, go into partnership to develop the fintech platform? And the rationale uh, behind um, the fintech platform is very much um, uh, coming back to kind of where we sit within the resources sector um, ecosystem. So um, not only do we have access to audiences, we have access to clients, um, and we operate in that in that sector. And, uh, the opportunity for us, uh, really, in 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 the fintech platform is uh, particularly uh, where we've started off and where we're doing the pilot in Australia is over 50% um, of any um, raisings in Australia are through uh, mainly through resources sector where we have a very, very strong presence. And so for us, it's an extension um, of our capability and, and our presence in that, in that, in that particular sector. So um, the FinTech um, platform was a natural extension and an adjacency of things that we already sort of deal with both from an investor perspective, clients who deal in that sector, um, and, and, and augments our uh, technology um, 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 you know, uh, credentials because technology is our key sort of um, um, IP um, uh, as we sort of move forward. And uh, now that you're building quite a lot of uh, software platform solutions, would that make sense from your side to expand to a new sector or maybe sell the software to other publishers that are in a completely different sector? Yeah, I, I, um, uh, that's always been in our, in our sort of uh, strategic consideration. So right now, 
uh, our model is very much um, um, develop the, the, the technology, um, prove the technology, commercialize the opportunity. Um, and once we feel we've done that um, in, in the sectors that we're in right now, um, um, it's very much right. How, how quickly can we move that model uh, into an adjacent um, uh, uh, new sector or new vertical? Um, we've been debating that for, for quite a while. And we believe that um, 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 you know, the, 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 the opportunity is everywhere uh, in terms of how we can deploy this technology. Um, uh, but in order to sort of stay focused uh, in where the biggest opportunity is and where we can make the most of the commercial um, opportunity, we, we are right now focusing on the three sectors um, purely because we want to develop the end-to-end -end, um, solution, both in terms of data, uh, content, and, and marketing services. And, and that can then be deployed in other sectors once we've proved the commercial model, which we are right now. And another question from the audience is uh, regarding your further capital strategy. And uh, will you take uh, on more money from the capital markets? But uh, I mean, you're well financed internally, but uh, I mean, it's a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, it, it's always a question of um, uh, the last few uh, uh, times we've gone out um, uh, externally to raise money um, has been to sort of support um, um, our investments, to support um, the business um, uh, in terms of uh, capital structure. Um, right now, um, where we are right now is um, we're, we're, we're reasonably well funded. Um, we're generating sufficient um, operational cash flow um, um, that will support our near-term sort of um, um, investment plan. Um, however, as I mentioned before, um, uh, depending on um, uh, what value um, uh, is seen by potential investors, uh, what opportunity comes up, whether it's an acquisition or, or, or an opportunity to accelerate uh, a key aspect of our strategy, Uh, and if that requires um, external funding, then we would always, always um, consider it. Uh, um, um, so it's not, it's never off the table. Uh, the question is really timing in terms of when we would do it and how we would do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the other key part is we we still believe we're significantly undervalued, and that's a current, you know, it's a common theme that we'll we'll, we'll keep mentioning. Uh, we don't believe uh, the market is is really understanding or valuing our business. Uh, the way it should and 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 so um as as that value uh, appreciation in the marketplace um starts crystallizing um, um that then makes um 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 you know new funding opportunities much easier to 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 accept yeah uh, and you you posted your your q2 preliminary results and and it showed another really strong growth and strong margins um, what, what is the main driver for this strong uh, sales growth? Um, actually, it's across the board. So um, uh, as we mentioned, um, uh, our uh, content um, uh, subscription model um, has been growing double digit uh, over 15% um, 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 for the last 23 quarters. Uh, that growth is unabated. So we, we for, for the first half of this year, we'll have delivered 19% growth just in our um, um, content as a service model or kind of subscriptions uh, model that, that delivered 19% growth. So um, that's carrying on as we have been for the last um, um, few years. Um, what we did see is a small rebound on the back of COVID. So for the last sort of uh, two years, um, uh, a lot of our marketing services business saw a lot of budget um, reductions from clients as they manage the impact of COVID. Um, and, and that optimism started sort of feeding back in again. So uh, people were starting to commit more uh, marketing um, budgets towards products, um, campaigns, et cetera. So that sort of started coming through um, in the first half. And, and I guess we, we, you know, the two new, new services that we launched over the last 18 months, um, Content Works um, uh, is now um, slowly establishing itself as a product and a service. So we saw very good growth in Content Works. Uh, double-digit growth in the first half as more and more people started um, using that service and and um, data uh, as a service which is a, a, the lead generation aspect uh, is continuing very very strongly so um, uh, we saw good growth from that so I, I guess the, the 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 main sort of um, point there is that it's not unique to one part of the business um, uh, actually all of the business lines uh, that we've highlighted uh, uh, deliver the growth 
Um, and I guess um, the, the, the turning point for us was obviously um, live events. Uh, as you know, for the last uh, two years, uh, live events were put on hold. Uh, we didn't have any live events. We lost between three and five million um, uh, Australian dollars in, in terms of revenue from not having um, um, held those live events. And, and we had our, our first uh, live event uh, in March. So that's uh, um, come back again. So we're hoping that uh, that now starts up again. So um, um, having delivered a, a live event in, in the first half allowed us to sort of deliver um, exceptional growth um, um, over and above what we would have reported in the first half. Okay. And uh, most of the other revenue is focusing on software as a service. So um, it's recurring. What's the what's the churn rate and uh, what's the the lifetime value of a customer? Um, so generally, um, um, our our uh, uh, retention rates. Uh, so the churn rate is about uh, fifteen percent, roughly. So we re our retention rate is about eighty five percent. The lifetime value um, works out to about um, um, six years per customer. Um, um, in terms of value, um, um, uh, lifetime value, um, 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 it, it, the total lifetime value um, uh, across the business as it stands right now is about $60 million. And that's purely just on the subscriptions business. Uh, it doesn't take into account um, everything else that we do outside of um, um, subscriptions. Okay. And another really interesting part is, is the new Blue Horse joint venture. Um, why did you decide to go for a joint venture and not uh, go alone? And maybe you can uh, talk about the joint venture partners a bit. And is it already profitable? Um, no, it's not profitable. Um, we are still in, in um, a final sort of build phase. So what I mean by that, we're just going through testing uh, of the platform is actually going to be launched uh, uh, very imminently. Um, um, so it's not live yet, uh, we're about to go live. So for the last um, um, 10 months, uh, it's actually being built and, and it's been in, in a development um, phase. Um, um, uh, why we went with uh, uh, other partners, but well, two main reasons. Uh, one is um, uh, our expertise uh, is very much uh, uh, around the ecosystem uh, we operate in, in terms of resources. Um, so the access to audiences, access to investors, access to clients who operate in the resources um, um, sector. Um, what the other two partners bring is actual um, 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 funding expertise, uh, 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 deal execution expertise. Um, and so that complements what we have. So um, uh, uh, between sort of three partners, uh, we we're able to sort of uh, tick uh, uh, all the sort of key capabilities from a, from a fintech uh, 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 platform in, in terms of crystallizing opportunities, whether it's through the brokers, whether it's directly with the companies who are being pre-IPOs or private placements. Uh, it's really, you know, utilizing the, the best capabilities uh, uh, across all of the partners to, 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 to create the value, really. Okay. And uh, maybe coming back to the live events, um, did they reach the same or did you reach the same amount of customers as before COVID or do you think it will come it already came back strong but will it keep on rising over the next events what can the shareholders expect <laughs> sure yeah, yeah I mean we we obviously our first event um, um, uh, was uh, in Australia uh, in Sydney uh, for future of mining uh, which which, by the way, has been our strongest sort of um, uh, event um, um, uh, across the portfolio. And, and two years ago, when we last held that event, um, we had over 500 attendees over two days. Um, um, we actually um, had uh, 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 more than that uh, for this event. So there, there's obviously a lot of demand for people wanting to have that face-to-face -face, um, 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 contact again and the networking opportunity. Uh, in terms of uh, revenue, uh, uh, we actually um, uh, delivered uh, slightly more than what we did um, the last time we ran that event. Uh, um, and so that event is continuing to grow um, and we see that growth coming through. And I think um, uh, on the back of that, without knowing whether that's going to be the same when we hold the other events in, 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 in Europe and when we hold the other events in the US, but our, our expectation is uh, now that um, things are coming back, we expect uh, that momentum to carry on in the same way uh, as we saw in, 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 in Sydney. 
So excellent answers. I think uh, 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 great presentation. Uh, I, I still don't know why your stock is so underweight. It looks excellent. I mean, the the quality of earnings is excellent. It's uh, mostly re re recurring and the high margins speak for themselves. Um, the time is already up, but the next speaker hasn't arrived yet. So I just give you one last question to, to finish it all up. Maybe you can say something about your, your strategy for the next three to five years uh, and what else uh, the other shareholders or potential shareholders should know. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll just reiterate um, um, uh, some of the final comments from Alex in the presentation. Um, we ourselves um, uh, uh, have evolved from being a purely media business. Um, uh, we firmly believe that um, uh, our technology capabilities underpin everything that we're doing. Uh, we've evolved um, um, from purely a media tech business uh, and, and data is slowly becoming a, a key part of our strategy uh, and a key enabler for us going forward. So. Uh, the opportunity for us, uh, uh, both organically, uh, but also in terms of uh, penetration within the sectors we operate in, uh, are quite significant. Uh, the only constraint uh, in terms of getting to that opportunity is really um, uh, our uh, uh, capacity or our need to be absolutely sure that we're commercializing it to the fullest extent. Um, and I guess the key, the key aspect is, um, we, uh, we, we've been able to demonstrate uh, new technology and new services that we've been launching, whether it's content works, uh, whether it's data services in terms of lead generation pilots that we're doing. Uh, uh, and that's allowed us to sort of now fully commercialize those opportunities and reinvest um, uh, some of the opportunity into creating a, a, a fully fledged um, uh, data and analytics um, opportunity for us. And, and I guess the final point is, um, uh, without even uh, uh, considering uh, our organic opportunities, uh, uh, we continue to look at adjacencies. So um, the three things that um, um, Alex highlighted, Esperanto, which is a technology platform uh, for translation, which is a huge opportunity for us um, uh, uh, to get better penetration in the non-English non subscriptions market. Um, uh, the, the fintech platform, which is uh, imminently about to launch, and we believe will be, uh, hopefully we're hoping, will be a very good success uh, in its pilot phase in, in Australia. Um, and obviously, uh, the data platform that we're starting to, to, to build, um, uh, 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 we see that as, a, as a, a, another huge opportunity for us um, um, uh, in, to augment everything that we're doing. So um, hopefully, um, um, that provides a, a good conclusion to Asmont as a business. Excellent. Thank you very much.